Hi, this is Lexus Bill, host of Drive Time on Joy 99.7 FM. Listen, you don't have to worry if you miss Drive Time or personality profile. It's going to be live on our podcast page. Just log on to www.myjoyonline.com forward slash podcast. You can listen to Drive Time, personality profile, and any other of your favorite shows on Joy FM on that page. You don't have to miss a show at all. Joy 99.7 FM Radio for discerning listeners. Now, sometime in June this year, we brought you news that at least four local pharmaceutical manufacturers were ready to provide the Ghanaian market with COVID-19 vaccines. This was according to the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana. The announcement came after government revealed that they were pursuing local options of production following setbacks encountered with foreign markets. The health minister, Kwekwa Jumaimenu, said his outfit was already in talks with these local companies to facilitate production. This morning, the National Vaccination Committee, led by Professor Kwamra Finpon Boateng, is holding a stakeholders workshop on moves by Ghana to begin the process of manufacturing its own vaccines in the future. Let's take you live to that event now. And then we come to what we call formulation, the final product. It has to meet a specific formula. And everything, all the ingredients have to be put together and the final product has to be consistent. If we take what is the antigen, which will induce the immune response, it's usually accompanied by an adjuvant, which will enable it to be introduced into the, the human being to the appropriate cellular or tissue target. It sometimes comes with preservatives and stabilizers to ensure that the antigen doesn't break down until it gets into the, the, the human system. Sometimes there are septants and there are residuals. And then finally, we need to dilute the vaccine to introduce it into the human body. So the formulation is a very critical step that the regulatory authorities ensure that is, is, is in place. Next slide. So finally, um, you then have to produce a vial. You have to ensure that the bulk that you started with is distributed into clean, sterile containers, and that this process of filling these valves does not destroy the, 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 the vaccine, which I told you is a, is, is a bio, you know, viable substance, okay? And you have to ensure that the caps are also put in a sterile manner. And if you've, you've, you've been um, in the hospital environment, you realize that you even have to ensure that, you know, uh, everything uh, in the immunization process is, 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 is um, very clean and sterile. I remember there were some discussions about when the uh, COVID vaccines were introduced into Ghana, whether the nurses had to wear gloves or not, because now everybody had an idea of how clean, you know, the process of immunization should be. So it, it's important that the final product is clean, it is sterile, and has been produced in a good manufacturing atmosphere. Next slide. So, as part of the distribution and the inspection, it, it's very important to ensure that everything is clearly monitored and the quality standards uh, are, are maintained to ensure that a safe, potent, pure, and sterile uh, uh, product is, is delivered uh, to, the, to the end user. Next slide. So what I've tried to describe to you in, in these uh, few slides is this complicated manufacturing process that starts with, you know, growing the, 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 the original substance, whether it's a bacteria or a virus. It goes through harvesting, purification, inactivation. We assemble it, we formulate it, then we put it into the valves, that is the filling. Sometimes it comes as dried powder, which is, uh, goes through a process called freeze drying. And then it is then packaged, okay, to be distributed and even that process, if you've heard about the Pfizer vaccine, may require minus 70 storage conditions, transportation. So just producing the vaccine and distributing is an entirely complicated process. Production can take between six months to three years, okay? And we, we, we know that um, depending on the, the type of, 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 of process or product, 70% of the whole system would be just the regulation, the quality control, and, and the checks. It, it, it's as complicated as producing ice cream. When you, when you go to the supermarket, you have a choice, vanilla, strawberry, uh, uh, chocolate, okay? 
And, and when you taste strawberry, you want to make sure it's strawberry. If you pick up an ice cream in the supermarket and it is not frozen, it's a product that does not even meet your own standard. So the person making the ice cream has to make sure that when it's in the freezer, it actually is frozen and it remains frozen until it is consumed. And it is, what, safe and does not give you diarrhea. Okay, so same thing, multiply that 100 times to a vaccine which is going into your arm and the regulators must ensure that the quality control process, even through to the administration of the, of the vaccine, is, is done. So I think you've understood the background to the task that uh, the president has given to the committee whose members uh, uh, Dr. Nsia Sari has, has, has gone through. And some of the partners who we are currently working with, very important stakeholders, the uh, uh, German uh, uh, Ministry for Economic Cooperation, has even pledged a sum of 5 million euros for GIZ to work with, with us, to work with the government committee to ensure that the president's dream of establishing vaccine manufacturing in Ghana will come to fruition. We are currently talking to, to different companies, uh, uh, Merck, Romilag, and GLAT, who are important manufacturers of different kinds of equipment. And we hope that engagement with different partners will enable us to move our, our process forward. Next slide. So now that you have this background, why are we here? We're here because we need to discuss with you our vision, which is to achieve self-sufficiency in vaccine production to meet not just our regional, our national needs, but also uh, needs of the, of the, of the sub-region. And we hope that this will enable us to set up a, a self-sustaining process which will be sustainable over the years. So we want to be able to produce our own vaccines. That is our vision for, 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 for Ghana's va vaccine manufacturing uh, roadmap. And we think that this is possible with the support of all stakeholders working together, moving forward, knowing that, yes, we'll be able to produce vaccines in Ghana. Next slide. What are the strategies that will enable us to achieve this vision? This vision starts with the ability to establish domestic vaccine manufacturing plants. We want to strengthen the research, discovery, and development by academia, by research institutions, by any groups that will enable us to, to make homegrown vaccines in Ghana. For these vaccines to be acceptable, our FDA must have the capacity to, to regulate the process, which is at least 70% quality control and monitoring. So Ghana's FDA must be strengthened to enable it release and license all the vaccines that we will make, meeting international standards. And to achieve this, we think that there must be a permanent national secretariat that will coordinate vaccine development and manufacture in Ghana. Because we have existing research institutions, I come from one of them, we have private sector initiatives, we have various regulatory processes, and we think that bringing all of them together, coordinating and linking them will enable us to push forward with the vision of vaccine manufacture in, in Ghana. Next slide. So if we take the things that will help us to do this, very important are the partnerships, okay? Financing, funding. We need funding from various sources. The clinical trials that we have talked about, okay? These have to be done to ensure that any vaccines that are developed, okay, are effective, that they are safe. We need to engage in tech transfer. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. For existing technology that are available, we want to be able to access them. And of course, intellectual property. That was Professor Boleman Pofo. He is with the Noguchi Memorial Institute of Medical Research. He's also secretary of the National Vaccination Committee and he was leading that particular discussion. Meanwhile, the Ghana Health Service will from Tuesday begin administering another set of AstraZeneca vaccines. This follows the successful completion of inoculating Ghanaians with the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Program Manager, Expanded Program on Immunization, as the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Kwame Amponsa Chanu, has been telling Ejol Lai more about the vaccine rollout plan on the AM show. Uh, Tuesday, we'll start on, uh, from Tuesday. We had hoped we were going to start this week, but the preparations were quite uh, enormous. So. Come Tuesday, we'll, we'll start. All right, so what's the plan? Okay, so the plan is we are doing what we call equitable distribution. Remember, we have some backlog of um, 
Ghanaians who took the first shot yeah. and are awaiting the second shot. Uh, if you will recall, the last time we did a second dose on Mars, we started from first March, those who had received the vaccine from first March to ninth March. I don't know if you remember this. Yes. Yes. So in, in um, epidemic control, you normally want to protect the most vulnerable. Then, of course, you go to those who are stronger and so on until everybody is covered. And so when we started the rollout, we looked at some population segmentations where we targeted health workers, frontline persons and security people, people who uh, are above um, 60 years and older, and then also people with underlying conditions. All right. But we have the date, I mean, the date of vaccination and all that. That's why when we're doing the second dose, we targeted those who had received from first to ninth month. So for this exercise, we're doing some parts of the health workers as well as of uh, the general population, the general vulnerable population. All right. So we've done some equitable distribution to health workers across the nation. And then, of course, we don't then also continue with from where we left off with okay. those who would, would have received the vaccine, the first dose from 10th to 29th month. All right. And then we still have AstraZeneca in the pipeline. And so by middle of September, we would have covered all the, the rest of the people. So Let's move to the north now, where there's a race against time to save large tracts of farm produce and other properties likely to be destroyed by floods as authorities in Burkina Faso spilled the Bagri Dam today. Previous spills have left many residents displaced and several properties destroyed, including farmlands. We will touch base with our correspondents, but first, some residents living along the waterways of the White Volta River in the northeast region are complaining about the lack of assistance from the National Disaster Management Organization to help them evacuate. The spillage is an annual occurrence where billions of gallons of water are released from the Bagri Dam. The waters are barreled dangerously into the tributaries of the White Volta River in the northern, northeast, upper east and savannah regions starting from Gwenku at Zebela, uprooting trees, turning farmlands into rivers and forcing families to abandon their homes. The dam is mostly spilled around August and September each year when it could no longer contain above its 235 meters deep. Around 13 people were killed in the region last year and over 2,000 forced to leave their homes due to floods caused by torrential rains and the opening of the dam. This year, operators of the dam on Tuesday issued an alert announcing the dam will be spilled between August 27 and 30. But even before the spillage could start, hundreds of farmlands in communities in the West Mampurusi and Mampurgu Mwaduri district, which are usually the hardest hit, are already submerged in floodwaters caused by weeks of torrential rains in the region. You're still live on News Desk here with me, Daniel Daze. Let's take you back to that meeting of the National Vaccination Committee where Secretary to the Committee, Professor William Ampofo, is addressing that gathering. The WHO Maturity Level 4, that will enable them to do uh, uh, much more work on vaccine regulation. And the local or the domestic R&D program should, should have been uh, well, you know, grounded and have clinical trials ongoing at least five institutions. We think that um, we should have at least three financial proposals in place and at least three tech uh, uh, transfer partnerships also established. And alongside this will be the development of the human capital. And so we would have established a critical mass of experts to support vaccine R&D and also manufacture. If we go to the long term, beyond 10 years and more, we think that we would have the capacity, we should be making vaccines for our own expanded program of immunization. And this is music to the ears of the, of the Ghana Health Service. Because in 2027, Ghana is going to graduate from Gavi Alliance, which is currently working with UNICEF uh, to, to, to underwrite our, our vaccine needs. So that, that's as an important target you know, for, for, for the vaccine roadmap for Ghana. And our FDA should be fully capable of regulating 
all the domestic vaccine production uh, from R&D to the final finished products. We think that our domestic R&D program should then be churning out, you know, vaccine candidates for the next outbreak of a novel pathogen and even for, 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 for pandemics or whatever in, in the sub-region that are, you know, pertinent to us. We have Lassa fever, which is just a West African issue. You may have heard about uh, CSM meningitis belt that, you know, uh, West Africa. So we want to have the capacity to deal with our own problems and not depend on foreign entities to give us vaccines when they have finished immunizing themselves. We think that we should have a self-sustaining ecosystem for domestic uh, vaccine manufacturing. Self-sustaining because if we buy what we produce, if we eat what we grow, I think you've heard about, you know, those slogans. Now we want it to, to, to apply to, to vaccines and then we'll be in, in, in a better place. Next slide. So we have a budget. As uh, Dr. Nsiasa said, uh, uh, through the, 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 the the tenacity of, of, of His Excellency, we had 25 million that has been earmarked, you know, uh, for the next uh, uh, two years. Uh, we've looked at um, um, various cost estimates from various, you know, stakeholders that we've engaged with. Uh, we think that to establish the National Vaccine Institute for it to run, you know, effectively going forward, we need about 20 million USD. The establishment of local vaccine manufacturing plants, the, the cost. This is not funding that will come from government. We hope that private sector, you know, SDG initiatives, you know, uh, Ghana Investment Promotion Center, various, you know, uh, agencies will help us find, you know, at least $90 million that the private sector will need to, to set up, you know, uh, uh, vaccine uh, production. We think that uh, from the estimates we've got from, from R&D, uh, academia, at least about, uh, uh, 65 million would be required to go into infrastructure, into equipment, and into reagents for the next 10 years to, to, to really establish, you know, uh, vaccine R&D in, in Ghana. And FDA's upgrade to become a self, you know, uh, regulatory agency for vaccines will cost us about 5 million. And various partnerships, you know, all the groundwork that will be done, tech transfer, intellectual property, we think that uh, about 20 million over the next 10 years, we will go into this. So we have a total of about 200 million, but this will have to be, you know, uh, actually, you know, crystallized. This is an estimate that has come up from the situation analysis that we've done. And we hope that more of such, you know, engagements will help us to come up with, you know, what are the specific needs, you know, that, and then sources of, of, of funding that, 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 that will support this. There has been some talk, okay, at the sub-regional level of, of a, of a regional fund that would, you know, drive, you know, uh, uh, vaccine production and R&D in the sub-region. So when we look at it from Ghana, this is what we see, but of course, uh, uh, other, other factors could come into play uh, uh, to provide resources or, or, or to let us see what will be the cost going forward. So um, I think I'm coming to the end of the, of, the, of the presentation, but the most important thing that we should look at is the proposed establishment of the National Vaccine Institute. This is being taken forward at the presidency, at the cabinet level, and will also go to, to parliament. So as part of the uh, 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 consultation to ensure that we, are, we have a, the, the appropriate model, okay, we, we think that this uh, National Vaccine Institute will be housed in the office of the president, there will be a governing board from the various uh, ministries and, and agencies that will make it work, especially including the private sector. There will be a chief executive, there will be a secretariat, administrative, financial support, and then the four key areas we think that this institute will focus on is R&D, research and development. And of course, the manufacturing process itself, you know, to, to, to provide the enabling environment to facilitate the manufacturing, working closely with the FDA and the other, you know, regulators. Um, human capital development, the people who will have the required skill set and, and, and know how uh, to do the R&D and also to, you know, to, to staff these uh, vaccine manufacturing plants. And funding, tech, the technology transfer partnerships. All these are very key, and we think that in these specific blocks, they will be, um, they will be able to harmonize uh, the existing you know, agencies and work together in a focused way to enable us produce vaccines in, in Ghana. Next slide. So some of the current developments that are significant milestones, working with the GIZ uh, to, to do a, a, a specific study, analysis on 
how the application of fill finish technology will enable us to establish uh, uh, vaccine manufacturing, both for national and regional needs. Looking at the sustainability, the long-term uh, needs of such a, an enterprise, we, we, we think that we also have a market analysis, you know, or plan, looking at how, you know, the demand uh, structure, noting the graduation from, from, from Gavi in 2027, how we will understand, you know, the, 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 the market and the needs against the regional needs as well. I mean, one of the uh, private sector uh, uh, agents, uh, companies, DEC vaccines, has already gone ahead and secured a government guarantee uh, in terms of its uh, uh, stated aim to, to establish vaccine manufacturing. And this has enabled them to go ahead and pay a deposit for, for equipment that they need and pay their business plan to set up vaccine manufacturing in Ghana. And um, this uh, uh, government guarantee is very important for, for private sector you know, uh, investment in, in the area of uh, vaccine manufacturing. So we're very happy that uh, the president is taking this forward in you know, under his own, you know, uh, scrutiny uh, with, of course, with the support from the respective uh, ministries to ensure that uh, uh, the enabling environment is provided for, for vaccine manufacturing uh, to move forward. Um, because we want to continue to make this process interactive, uh, the contacts <laughs> for the uh, Presidential Vaccine Manufacturing Committee are up there, the email addresses. And uh, we are located in the COVID uh, Task Force uh, Secretariat. We, we, uh, the National Coordinator for COVID-19, Dr. Samwa Ba, has gladly given us uh, some space. We, we, we share his uh, meeting space, and we meet frequently uh, and review proposals and try and take forward the objectives and strategies that we have outlined. And um, we look forward to hearing your comments, uh, having your questions, so that together we can work together to, to make this uh, vision of self-sufficiency in vaccine production a reality. Thank you very much. You're live on Joy News Desk. Let's go. Uh, to other stories here, and we'll be speaking to some of our colleagues during the bulletin uh, who are monitoring the situation in the northern parts of the country as the Bagri Dam is being spilled today. Let's take a few messages. When we come back, we'll deal with those stories. Let's do business now. And many people want to build their own homes while others want to make outright purchase. So avoid the hustle of buying land, documenting, tiling, painting, etc. The Joy News Habitat Fair is that central point for exhibitors, building consultants, buyers, and prospective buyers to get solutions about housing and its accessories in an environment adherent to COVID 19 protocols. This year's edition will have three mini clinics at Chimota Retail Centre, West Hills Mall and Junction Mall and the main fair at the Accra International Conference Centre as well as virtual seminars during each event. Joy Business's um, Eben Sabote is standing by at the Ecobank headquarters to bring us more. Um, Eben, tell us what is happening there currently. Yes, so down here, if you can hear me, so I can see all it says for this year. Bank joining this habitat fair. We are here at the Eco Bank head office and I have with me here the general manager at fair. We are here at the Eco Bank head office and I have with me here the general manager in charge of sales at the multimedia group, Max Fuga, to give us a breakdown or an update of how far we've gone with arrangement and all that. I have here also Edward Boche, who is the executive director at Eco Bank here. And as you are aware, this year's theme is home ownership to build or to buy. So I'll start with Max Fuga, who will help us with some um, explanations on how come we landed on this theme and what we should be expecting this year from the Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair. So Max Fuga, welcome to Joy News. Thank you very much. So tell us uh, why we've chosen this theme for this year and what should be the expectations from patrons. Um, 
there's been a lot of debates um, as to whether people should build or they should buy their properties. I mean, this debate probably predated some of us, and it's still ongoing. Yes. And uh, the objective is to put it out there and then get the experts to come and talk about it, get the finance guys, get the real estate guys to come and talk about it so that participants and our audience can make an informed decision whether to buy or to build. Um, they, ha they, they all come with the advantages and disadvantages. Some will say, okay, I just want to buy. I don't want any litigation issues, so let me just buy. I just say, okay, uh, if you buy for the real estate guys, there are these, there are falls, there are these, there are sizes, there are the shapes, and so you want to build yourself. So it's, it's, it's a debate that has been going on, and we thought that this is an opportunity for us to provide a platform for the experts in the industry to come and educate people, inform people, so that we can make or we can take informed decisions whether we want to buy or we want to build our homes. In this era of COVID, uh, we've been having the Habitat Fair almost every year. I mean, uh, what's, how special is it going to be? Like, uh, how is it going to be? Just give us some little uh, background about this year's uh, particular one. You see, the interesting thing is that COVID or no COVID, people are still buying. If, if you go around, you drive around the countryside, you see a lot of developments. Okay, people are building. And I was asking myself, how come that COVID didn't affect the, the real estate industry? <laughs> but people, people are still sleeping. <laughs> okay, and I'm sure uh, Eddie mentioned that probably people are even taking more money to build. <laughs> <laughs> so people are still building. So whether COVID or no COVID, I mean, building industry is thriving. And for us as uh, organizers, we just want to provide a platform for people to assess the facilities or the, 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 the things that they would need to build their homes. And we are not only talking about the real estate industry or the building per se, we are talking about the accessories uh, that come with it. So we're going to have the furniture guys, we're going to have the, the home appliance guys, everybody is going to be there. Mm -hmm. So for us, COVID has not affected the industry so much. I mean, mm -hmm. practically, I can see it around. Mm -hmm. And so life goes on. What we would do as organizers is that for the main event that will take place from 27th to 31st October, we're going to put in the protocols and ensure that people who come are able to transact their business in, 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 in the best safety environment as possible. Talking about transacting business, I have here the EcoBank Executive Director, Edward Buche, who will be telling us some of the packages they have for uh, those who will be participating in this year's uh, Habitat Fair. So tell us, I know EcoBank has been with us, one of our financial institutions, uh, heavily uh, concentrated in the housing sector. Uh, what should we, be, should we be expecting when we come to the EcoBank stand or the reason why EcoBank is partnering this uh, program? What should be the expectation from the 2021 EcoBank Journeys Habitat Fair? Thank you very much. Um, I, I think that as we all know, Ghana as a country, we've got a housing gap. And as a big bank in Ghana, we do have a role to play. One of the things that we've been eager to do, um, not just for, for this year, but also in the past years has been how do we support our customers or our uh, clients as they seek to own their own uh, buildings. So we've got various options. Um, and I'm sure that for Ghanaians who come to our fair, um, they would get to see the various options that is available to them. We've got options where even if you cannot afford the down uh, payment that, is, that you ought to cough up, we can find a way to support you as part of that uh, process. So we are very eager um, to, to, to help our customers to achieve their, their aims. And we, we think that this would be a very good show. Mm. You talk about options that you have for uh, participants. Uh, when you look at the team to buy or to build, so my question would be, uh, do we have a special package for people who want to build and a special package for people who want to buy, or you have the same kind of I mean, oh, no. package? I, mean, for I, I think that whatever um, choices that our customers make um, for, for us as a bank, our bet is to find a way to support them to that. So if anyone wants to buy, if anyone wants to build, um, we are able to support them through that journey. Um, so as a bank, that is what we, we uh, seek to do. So after the Habitat Fair, normally we know that you are always coming out with uh, products and services for customers and all that. Can you walk us through some of the packages that you have for, I mean, home, uh, potential homeowners or home builders? 
I mean, after the Habitat Fair, if anybody wants to come to Ecobank to, you know, acquire uh, a service or, you know, something to support their home ownership dream. I mean, I could spend the whole day walking you through what the options are, but just to say that um, whatever your needs are, reach out to us, and, and we would find a way to, to help you along that journey. Basically, whether you want to build, whether you want to buy, we've got products for you, okay? Um, throughout the options that, that you might choose, um, Ecobank has got options that you'd find attractive in terms of pricing, in terms of interest rates, in terms of the, the whole package, you know? So what we offer to um, customers is not just a loan, but the whole holding your hand through the, through the entire journey. And I think that for us, that is one thing that we are very proud of. Mm. So that was Edward Boche, Executive Director at Ecobank Ghana. Let me end with Max Fuga here. Uh, tell us the venue for the main event and what protocols are put in place to ensure that people who are coming uh, are not at risk, uh, you know, the times in which we are. Okay. Um, let me first say that uh, this year's fair is being supported as usual by our partners from Ecobank. Uh, last year was great, and uh, they decided to stay with us. So we look forward to uh, a long-lasting marriage with <laughs> Ecobank. <laughs> uh, we also being supported this year for the first time at the uh, partnership level by Cities and uh, Habitats. Uh, these are the guys uh, redeveloping uh, the Kpon Katamasu area and other cities. Um, that are in their portfolio that they are redeveloping. They've also come on board as our partners this year. And we have a lot of sponsors who are already uh, here with us. Some already are, uh, are here with us. Um, we are very grateful to them for the partnership this year. Um, between today and 27th, we line up a series of clinics that will bring the sponsors and our partners face-to-face uh, -face with their clients or potential clients. So we have uh, uh, clinics, I think, um, at... Uh, at Chimotamo, we're going to have one at the West Homo. We have one in Tema, because over the years, we've realized that we've neglected the Tema site. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of development is taking place. So we've arranged to have one clinic in Tema to take care of the Tema site. And we also arranged one around Teshi, so that we can take care of the Labadi, Teshi, Spinters Road community. So all these clinics are to afford our sponsors and potential buyers or builders <laughs> the opportunity to come face to face with the suppliers and engage them. And like uh, Eddie is saying, so that they can walk them through the journey, the entire journey. And at the end of the day, they will decide whether they want to buy or they want to build. So with these activities, I've been lined up before um, 27th, which is the main day for the start of the 2021 edition of the Habitat Fair. So for the Habitat Fair, for the first time, we are doing five days. That's a unique thing. We normally yeah. do three days. Yeah. Now, because of the demand that we had from last year, this year we decided to extend the days, five days. And these five days, we're going to have clinics. We're going to have lectures under various themes. Okay, so people will have an opportunity to come and tell us, should people buy or should people build their own homes? And we hope that at the end of it all, we'll have satisfied and put this debate to rest and encourage <laughs> people whether they should buy or yeah. they should build their homes. In terms of protocols, I can assure you that we have put in place stringent measures to ensure that business is transacted in the safest of environment. That I can assure you. Okay, so Dana, if you can hear me, that was Max Fuga, General Manager in Charge of Sales, and Edward Bucci, Executive Director at Ecobank here, telling us what to expect at the main event, and then also the fact that we are ready to launch the Ecobank Journeys Habitat Fair 2021 today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ebenezer Sabote with Joy Business. It sounds very exciting how ready we are to bring you the Joy News Habitat Fair. Do join us at any of the mini clinics and at the main fair when you can. Live on Joy News Desk with me, Daniel Daze. Kobe Spikey and Chroma joins me very shortly with Tech Talk. And it's time for Tech Talk with Kobe Spikey and Chroma. So much has been happening in the tech world this week, Kobe. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even know where, where you should start from. But um, since I need to make the announcements that um, the Apple family has a new member, 
Let's start with the App Store news, shall we? So, so the Apple, you know, Apple has had a lot of heat from developers because of their Apple tax. Basically, Apple charges 30% of every transaction on the App Store. And for developers, that's, that's a hefty fee for them to pay. Imagine if Apple is taking 30% of just a $1 transaction people would make on your app. And Apple says, okay, you know what? We're now going to allow you to accept payments from different methods, not within the app though, so you can send like an email to your subscribers or your users, and they can pay for, let's say, power apps in a game or premium versions of an app without going through the store, the Apple store, because okay. it's been considered as anti-competitive. You know, there's no mm. option for others to download apps except in the app store. You can't get an app anywhere except in the app store. Yeah. You can't make any transaction in, the, in an Apple app except in the App Store. To the extent that Epic Games, makers of Fortnite, are also even suing Apple because of this, because it's affecting the business. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, Apple says that. Well, it hasn't affected what's happening with Fortnite yet. That's Epic Games yet. But we, 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 we live to see what's going to happen. I think that the complaint that. about Apple over the years has been it's very rigid. Yes, indeed it is. Yeah, and very locked down. Mm -hmm. And so... The, the Android market has had some advantage over them, yeah. especially in, in the developer world. Yes. Which is why you are such a... <laughs> <laughs> An Android geek. Yeah. yeah, okay. But let's talk about Tim Cook now. Some good yes. times for him, good money. Last year, Tim Cook was a billionaire. Yeah, he, he just crossed into the one billion mark. And this year, he has made $750 million out of the shares that he owns in Apple. So he made a deal with... Steve Jobs, that if he managed to grow the business and he's managed to grow the business over a hundred percent, you know, the, the, the stocks have risen over a hundred and ninety percent or so. And uh, yeah, so he's been given 600 as a result of that. His reward was about 675 million dollars. Yes, so yeah, he's gotten some money that you and I can only dream of. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> Actually, 750 yeah, million. 750 dollars. million. Yeah, 750 million. 750 million dollars. That's, that's, that's a lot of money, bro. Yo, Tim, you Almost know a billion. You know we are friends, right? Like, oh, are you? Well, he plans to donate most of the money, you know, to charities. You know, he's, he's a strong... Charity? Yeah. I'm you're not, you're not called charity. You're called <laughs> Dave Daniel. Dad's I am it. a charitarian. <laughs> I'm a charity case. <laughs> I mean, I'll be a charity game for 750 mil. It's a <laughs> so, lot yeah. of money. Well, it's, it's towards um, HIV and AIDS, um, yeah. equality, and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, he's, he's donating most... You know, Bill Gates started that whole thing. Yeah, that the giving let's, pledge. Let's give out our money. So him and Warren Buffett, they've given out their money. And he says he'd give out all his money before he dies. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. he's going to give, you know, all his money... What's the point of making so much? Anyway, that's, that's yeah. another conversation. Um, so where are we going next? So Airbnb says it's going to host 20,000 African refugees for free. Very now this is good news story. because, yes, yeah. um, we've seen that um, the displacement and resettlement of Afghan refugees in the U.S. is, is one of the biggest crises that they're, they're experiencing, considering that where are they going to stay? You know, and Airbnb, if you know Airbnb, they are a service that provide housing for people. So if you have a house and you want to rent it, you can put it on Airbnb and people can rent it for a short it's while. basically Uber for, for houses. For houses. That's yeah. the way I was going to say, but you took it right out of the mouth. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they've decided that they're going to give Afghan refugees free accommodation. And that's a very good cause. And I like Very, that. very. And, and I love cause. the way the world is coming to yeah. the aid of Afghanistan. Remember... Mm -hmm. Recently, Rwanda mm -hmm. has offered to host a school in Afghanistan. So Rwanda is going to accept Afghan refugees. And, and this is a school, 250 students and staff mm. and, 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 facu and other faculty members. Okay. And they will be, yeah, they've actually left um, Afghanistan. Um, they've left Kabul. They are tracking their journey till they finally reach Rwanda. So it's great what Airbnb is doing. Yep, yeah, it is, yeah. absolutely. Awesome stuff. Yes. Um, that can't be all. Like, That's not all. Facebook wants your next meeting to be in VR. Virtual reality. Yes, exactly. And I watched a video where an, a tech influencer was hosted with Mark Zuckerberg and some Facebook 
you know, big shots in virtual reality world. In, so you'll actually see them in VR, like, but it was like an avatar of them. It wasn't oh, their okay. actual selves, it was just an avatar, which was actually interesting. I would like to have a meeting in VR. I mean, I don't want to leave my home and then go travel to go sit in a meeting. That's probably just going to last 30 minutes, maximum an hour. No, just put on your VR headset, look around and you're in there. See, you can hear people. And because of spatial audio, you know who's talking to who. So I can turn left and I know someone's talking to me from this direction. Spiky. I can turn right and someone's talking to me from that direction. And yeah, Spiky. you know, yes. With Ghana's cost of data and Wi-Fi, mm. I'll make a phone call. <laughs> well, I'll make a well, phone. it's a start. It's a start to getting to something that will save us all, you know, I mean, saving I mean, the I, planet, I, I, I no to, pollution. I don't want to sound like a downer or anything. Yeah. But I'm saying that the internet, the bandwidth and the mm. cost of carrying a virtual reality conversation across jurisdictions is not going to be a joke. I think that the For Ghana. Yes. Why is I think that the me? underlying issues of availability and cost of data must be addressed on a continental level. So don't poop on my party. As I want can. VR meetings. If you are inviting me to a meeting, make sure it's VR. <laughs> Okay. I want to be in my house. I already have a VR so headset. So the next time I am talking to Kobe Spike in Chroma on news desk, it will be, be via VR. Via VR. And um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see my avatar here with Spike here. Yes. Yeah. Finally, remember last time we were talking about OnlyFans saying that they're no longer going to do accept sexual content. Well, they've done a U-turn. They say, um, you know what, we, we, we will still accept that kind of content. Well, you see, only fans saying they don't accept sexual content is like Joy News saying that we don't do news anymore. <laughs> only fans wasn't intended for that purpose. It just sort of happened to become that platform where... I actually beg to differ. The key investors in only fans have been investing in the adult industry, in the online adult industry It just for happened. Years. It's just that they, they are private investors and they have to stay that way from it the It just happened. It just <laughs> happened. You know, like, something had to signal them that this is a good investment, and they saw it. <laughs> OnlyFans was intended to, you know, like, I, I could have an OnlyFans where I'm sharing my beats, you know what I mean, in music. So this was recent. Beats. This was recent. No. The, the, the opening of OnlyFans into the mainstream market was recent. Like, come on. It, only, only fans became only fans during the pandemic. You see, you are Twitter people. It's all <laughs> Twitter people. You are the people who've turned only fans into a sex workers, <laughs> you know, explicit content uh, repository. But it's more than that. And I'm one of the people who thinks only fans is more than. Don't do, reduce. Only do, fans do you have an only fans account? No, I don't. But I will. <laughs> Not for sexual content. For my music. Do you visit only fans? What am I going to do there? I don't have a credit card to spend. <laughs> All right, so um, you know that that's not a limitation for someone like you. <laughs> a credit card is a limitation for someone like you. All right, so um, we are wrapping up the show at this point. Kobe Spike and Kruma. Thank you. See Kyle. you in VR next time. Yeah, 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 definitely. My name is Daniel Dazi. This has been Joy News Desk. I'll see you at midday during Joy News today. Till then, up next is Joy News Interactive. See you. Thank you.